Hello. Thank you all for your films. Um, so to start, um, I had a question for Miriam and Josh. Um, you both are working in these kind of sci-fi worlds that you've created. And um, each of the works are is kind of tackling this contemporary political issue, but you chose to kind of think through it in a speculative world that you've created. So can you talk about that choice? Um, so I think for me, it's just like trying to understand like how sci-fi is like a proxy, like uh, right, like it's always been just like about the present, um, but it becomes like a tool for abstraction that makes it easier to process stuff. Um, and then, you know, so, so the, this, it was the last film, Life on, Life on the Caps, and it's the third chapter of a trilogy. And basically, I'm talking about Morocco, but um, with people kind of playing themselves. And like the speculative aspect just like allows me to like not say it's Morocco and it changes the conversations I can have around it because I was getting kind of bored um, with like how people are like, when it, whenever it's like it's not here, they just get so stuck on cultural specificity, mm -hmm. either by being too focused on it or by being scared to talk about stuff. Mm -hmm. And for me, obviously, that's an important aspect, but I just wanted to kind of like, yeah, I just abstract things. So that's that's kind of like the speculation um, choice. Yeah. And for me, I, I mean, I guess I've made a lot of work about the present, you know, and kind of like certain aspects of the present that are obscured often by what's going on. But now I think the present so, um, I don't know. I mean, I don't need to explain it to you. Everybody's lived through the last two years. Like, you know, the future is is interesting because you can kind of see where things are going and yet people are in denial about this. And so I think it's interesting to present images of where things might go so that we can potentially redirect. Like the present, there's very little to do about the present at this point, you know, other than to react against it. And like, I think the future is interesting in many ways, you know, like I think you can look at it as a warning, but it's also something like a site of aspiration. Um, you know, like what what could happen, and also what what do you want from the future? Um, Arna, in Urban Solutions, but also I was thinking about this with Mariam's film as well. Um, you are using many different filmic modes that you kind of blend together. So there's like the, the fictional element, we see some documentary footage kind of on the streets and the historical kind of narrative of the German artist, the, the voiceover there. Um, and, and Miriam in your film as well, which is seen throughout the Caps trilogy, which I love the way you, you know, create these um, commercials and um, bring also these kind of documentary moments within the world you create and um, yeah really kind of blend all of these different modes together so I wondered if you could both speak to that um, <clears throat> yeah for us it developed actually with the film mm -hmm. and it, um, it became clear that it's um, like leaving whatever you would conceive as a pure um, documentary form behind um, was actually helping us a lot in, in getting much more to the to the idea that we wanted to focus on that's um, but it's it's been a, a process i would say it's it's not been planned um, is exactly like like that it's been a process also because it's it's for filmmakers involved, but also a lot of um, discussions um, with people on the set and before filming, and um, especially with the porteros, with the, the doorman, um, where it was quite clear that um, the documentary and the fiction come together in some, some form. I just have a question. I, I was wondering if um, everything was written after their real experiences or if it was made up? Um, well, the, the idea that we started with was actually the security 
technology and these figures of the doorman as guarding the threshold of the safe interior and the the outside which is always conceived as something really really bad and um, that was what we started with and then actually anything else developed um, in lots of interviews with um, Porteros. Okay. Um, so for the the kind of like mixing of genres, um, well for me it's like fun first. Um, I like yeah to just like play with different styles and like just like create, um, like play. It's like almost like an exercise. It's like car commercial, and um, and but also like it's something that I do in all my videos. I'm like I don't really have loyalty to one genre. I'm like whatever will work best for this scene. Like if it needs to feel like reality TV because it's dramatic, I'll do. It. You know what I mean? Like yeah. it's kind of like what matters is more the emotional kind of like frequency you're going through. Like you know it's like obviously political, but. I didn't want to be like didactic, like I don't have the knowledge to like make a political film and that about like the future. It's more like how does it feel for the main character? Mm. And then like what are the specificities of the world that kind of like add to that experience of the feeling of being mm -hmm. in it? Mm -hmm. So it's like, yeah, that, that this is what the commercials look like, this is what the internet looks like. Yeah. I love the tongue scan. <laughs> Um, Josh, I know you built extensive models of New York for this film. Can you talk about? I did. Um, my production designer and set yeah, designer. Yeah, if you want to shout out anyone. Actually, I mean, a bunch of people are actually here. My producers, Eliza and Jill and Alicia and Grace, who are set designers, and the DP, Kelly. I think we've also got a couple of the actors, like Aaron, Malik, and Marlon may or may not be here. But anyway, hi if you are. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I wanted, I mean, I've always been obsessed with like that style of like sci-fi filmmaking, like from when I was little, when like, you know, films like Blade Runner and I mean, I guess even Star Wars were like around. And um, I don't know, I just, you know, like I'd made a lot of work with CGI like in the early 2010s. And um, I feel like it's like, it's everywhere, you know, or it was everywhere and like everything started looking, um, you know, similar in a way, and I really wanted a break from it. Like I felt like I wanted to make a sci-fi film that didn't just feel like the 2010s in the future, although maybe I made something that feels like the 70s in the future, I don't know. But like, I just, I just, you know, wanted to go somewhere else. And now I'm actually going back into video, you know, like I'm going back into like these styles of like image making, but I just like wanted something else just cause you know, like I think Technology often roots works in specific moments, and um, I don't know. There are other technologies that can like free you from that, or like it's kind of an attempt to kind of find some space, some space from like the present. Mm -hmm. that so makes sense. right. So beyond the models, like using analog film for the, you for the the kind of aesthetic look, kind of unbound you from the visual feel of the time or something to like take you to another more ambiguous I mean, moment. Maybe I just wanted to get far away from anything post-internet. But I, you know, I also, um, but I don't know, moods change. Now I'm like back to the computer. So <laughs> I don't know. But well, I, you know, like I also just was really interested in film. Like I wanted to make something that had more of a conversation with like cinema than with like, you know, video art. <coughs> Um, Arna, I wonder if you could speak more about the collaboration, because if um, I'm not mistaken, it's two different collaborative groups that came together, and the four of you worked together, I think, for the first time. Would you speak about that? Um, well, um, it's as maybe if you if you um, happen to see it in the in the titles, it's um, Party Wazio is the is the collective from Brazil and um, Cinema Copain, it's, it's basically me and uh, my partner in, in Berlin. Um, so it's a French name. <laughs> um, and we met in Brazil five or six years ago. And uh, then at the time we spent um, like four months in Brazil and um, like 
with the coming f with the central European perspective, there are a lot of things felt quite different. And um, I mean, I have to say um, the same happens to me in, in the United States also because on the on the surface it's it's all very similar. But then if you try to understand things below the surface, you have to you have to talk a lot. To, um, and we discussed a lot actually and one of these uh, moments was um, why is it that fear is so much a concept that people take into their everyday life and um, why is it that everybody advises you not to walk home at night and so there's like these little cultural differences that point to might point to something and we try to to look deeper into it and um, in Brazil especially um, if, if you like try to um, try to make some holes and look underneath it's 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 obvious that um, that you come to colonialism and um, slavery, which was um, abolished only in, in 1886. So it's it's not so far away. And one of the one of the porteros in the film actually had um, a grandmother who was still born um, a slave. So you have uh, like a certain level of um, of remembering that is. Um, that is like it's not only history in, in terms of something you, you have from from books, which for for the German perspective is incredible. And um, the other thing was that um, um, you find these these old um, imprints f uh, made from uh, a German, like there were two European artists roughly coming in the same time to Brazil, doing more or less um, similar works and being very interested, especially in this uh, social life of, of uh, European colonialists and their slaves um, also like at home and in working situations. And they both called their books um, Voyage Pittoresque au Brasil afterwards. And they both uh, published them in 1835 and 1836. So these images um, you can find in many places in Brazil, like in, in a very famous coffee bar in Sao Paulo. It's, it's um, like all over the, the place you have this uh, image from the coffee plantation. And um, we we found it very interesting that on one hand it's it's really still like the the image that you have in Brazil from the past is um, very much related to these old prints, and at the same time it's um, you can see it like the way it's it's put in in uh, public rooms, you can see it as an as an um, idealized kind of idyll, um, I don't know if it's if if that's the right English word, um, idyll, um, and so that was um, that was the other like we when we came to Brazil and when we discussed with our friends all these topics, we um, kind of condensed it to this. Um, to these two themes, the the porteros, as I said, the the and the theme of the threshold, and um, these images by European artists who come and um, depict what interests them, and then they vanish and um, leave something back that is, um, yeah, you can you can say uh, haunting the society even like 200 years afterwards. Miriam, um, 
the first part, Party on the Caps, is um, very much focused on this matriarch and her birthday, and um, that's kind of like the center characters of the piece. And in this one, it's around this father-son dynamic. Um, and so I wondered if, for you, the starting point was the characters or where the kind of story came from. Um, I Yeah, like, basically, you know, so everyone is playing a version of themself, themselves, and um, I kind of like do casting, either it's family members or the internet, um, and so the two main characters, they're these rappers in Marrakesh that made these like funny songs, and I felt like we had similar sense of humor, so I went to hang out with them, explaining what I had planned, that we were going to do this protest around the Qa, which is um, the clapping, which is a type, a genre of music from Marrakesh, and I knew I wanted to work with that. And but everything else was like, you know, I hung out with them for a while, and then based on things that I was learning, you know, about them, I changed the stories. Mm -hmm. For example, Kemai was telling me he was getting really buff, so I was like, oh, maybe it's a new body. You know, you just bought it. It's like, <laughs> and you're actually 65, <laughs> and um, they had a dynamic where one of them is a bit wiser, so I was like, maybe that's your son. <laughs> Because like it was hard to break their friendship in on camera. Like it was too like um, I don't know how to explain. Like I wanted to challenge them a little bit, mm. but then everything else is really based on like stuff like feelings that they share with me, or like the debates are debates that I kind of like start and then see what happens. Like about violence, for example, in protesting or, or like using art and representation. So stuff like that, letting it. I'm just pushing a little bit. Um, yeah. Great. Let's open up to questions. hungry this means people <laughs> want to eat dinner Miriam could I ask you a question yeah. I'm just curious like after this like trilogy of like or you know after the series of art videos do you see like caps as a setting like continuing on in like other works I mean I know you're working on things that aren't for the art world um no it was a trilogy and I'm like it's over you know I um I have a hard time I decided because before I started that it was a trilogy because it sounds good to say trilogy, and then like I did it and <laughs> I'm like okay, enough you know, uh, it's just a tool, I, and I think I'm interested in finding more tools that are proxies to talk about stuff, um, but I'm also very like uh, hyperactive like I'm, when I'm done with something I'm just like I want to try something different, so so even this chapter I feel like I just watched it and like liked it less. Um, and like the first ones were way more upbeat and like I feel like I got a bit like too much in the world and like in a way that doesn't serve that it lost the freshness or something mm -hmm. so but you know I mean I think there's like um, good things in like things being more slow and mature but I like the energy yeah what about you with the work yeah I mean I'm writing a feature I know yeah you're yeah a book like I'm yeah. not I'm not done but it won't look like the 70s <laughs> What would it look like? Video. I mean, I want it to look like something else. You know, like I I don't want it. I don't know. That's what's tricky with like these technologies. You know, like I like the way that you use them like a lot. Um, but it's also like I want something that feels real. You know, like I think a lot of the cinema that I'm the most, that I've been the most influenced is like stuff like, you know, like, you know, the Festin, you know, like Dogma 95 and like rather than like, I don't know, um, Star Wars, you know, and so it's like, but how do you make that in the future? You know, if you want to set something in like a New York that's been flooded, you know, it's yeah. it's it's going to be a challenge. Well, you have big challenge with special effects and budget, but <laughs> <laughs> I think that like yeah, it's funny what you were saying like the seventies, like you watch period films, like you know, and and um, period pieces and sci-fi pieces. There's the you can recognize the time they were made and the time they're depicting. Always, and um, but I think that's cool. Like I think you can't really fight your time. Like it's more about like maybe reinventing something inside of it. But yeah, I think so too. I just went through a period where like I think there was such a strong reaction to this work at the beginning of the 2010s by like certain people whose opinion I don't know if it's valuable anyway. Um, you know because I think just the speed of things has increased so much. You know including the speed of reaction mm -hmm. against like you know, the style of a moment or an era and like, and then that style distracts from like the content, you know, but then 
it keeps going because that's the technology that we're living with for like 20, 30 years. And then you're like, oh, wait, no, we can go deeper into this. I think it's not necessarily like, sorry, now we're like digging. <laughs> like, it's, I don't think the, the invention has to only like rely on the technology. There's also in the storytelling, I mean, there's just, I think there's a lot that can be done with a little bit, or like with like embracing, yeah. Um, I mean, you both chose film, it's classic. <laughs> and no, it's cool, it looks amazing, both the films, yeah. Yes, um, um, we're gonna bring a mic to you. Like my my personal view on it is, um, I really like to hear original languages, and um, so we we never thought of like doing it in in English because that's um, for like um, maybe maybe to just briefly add like if if um, since I'm I'm from Europe. And you have this situation where English is the the lingua franca, like the overall English, uh, the overall language that you can use everywhere. But it leads to to a specific um, illness in in communication because apart from the English, nobody really masters it, obviously. So wherever English people um, come to the the front. They dominate the discourse. Everybody's um, surprised how how well that sounds, whereas everybody else is making really bad, Im uh, giving a very bad image. <laughs> and so, it's um, the the only way to react to it is actually to to um, make people capable of of understanding, like passively. Um, at least understanding several languages and being um, understood if you if you talk in your own language. Um, well, language is very political in a lot of places. In Morocco, is extremely political. There's everyone just mixes like Arabic, French, Berber, Spanish. Like it's just everything that's it's very much part of the culture, and it's like a curse and also something amazing. You know, like that there's no sentence with like, perfect, like, you know, if you're being kind of fascist, um, like language. And so I think that's very much also the idea of the caps, like in the future, like how culture evolves. Um, and like, I'm s I've been noticing something, which is that now young people in Morocco reject French and really like embrace English. It has its own problems, but the rejection of French is really interesting and cool. Um, because it's been so elitist for so long. I mean, I have a French accent as I'm saying this, but like, it's true. So like, for example, with Kamel and Amin, we communicate in English now. So I think this mix of the film is purposeful, like purposely on Inderija, more in Inderija in English, to reflect this evolution of language and this language that's very um, kind of like also like internet language maybe, you know? Um, yeah, so, and also, you know, in the art world, I think you can use any language, you don't have like a, commercial, not that I would do that, but like it's a conversation I feel like in film space about like just ratings <laughs> and stuff like that. People don't want to read subtitles, uh, but yeah. But it's it feels important, it's true, yeah. I think we need to end there, I'm sorry, we're out of time, but thank you all so much for your work. Thank you.